Hey everyone, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Kelly Pirtle with NOAA Communications in Norman, Oklahoma, and a member of NOAA's Central Region Collaboration Team, and I'm your host for today's webinar. The three-minute thesis webinar today has been organized by the NOAA Central and West Regional Collaboration Teams to share information about NOAA's use of uncrewed systems. This is a very timely and interesting topic and a growing area. We chose these presenters because they represent the variety of activities happening in NOAA right now, as well as the new opportunities this technology provides. I am so excited for these presentations and hope you will enjoy them. Each of today's panelists will have three minutes and one slide to cover their topic. Those three minutes go pretty fast, but you can get a lot of information in too. This format is based on a model used by universities across the country as a way to briefly share information about a project, initiative, or research. You can see from the outline, after each group, we will take a break for questions from you, our audience. And at the end, all of the panelists will return to respond to your questions for a few minutes. At any point, during the presentations, please submit your questions in writing using the questions pane of the GoToWebinar panel. Asia Shumalo, the coordinator for the NOAA West Regional Collaboration Team, will be taking your questions and sharing them with our presenters. So get your questions in early. We are recording today's webinar, that's good news, and it will be posted by Wednesday on our homepage. That's www.noaa.gov slash central region. We'd love to get your feedback on this event. Please take a moment at the conclusion of today's webinar to complete a very brief survey. We're, let's get going. <laughs> We're gonna start our webinar with an overview of the topic by Captain Philip Hall, the director of the NOAA Uncrewed Systems Operations Center in the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations. He has a background as a NOAA Corps aviator and has had a lot of experience with developing and operating large UAS like the Global Hawk and Predator for Earth Science missions. As director of the UXS Operations Center, he and his staff are working across all of NOAA to increase the operational capabilities in NOAA. Phil, take it away. Great, thank you so much. And I'm really, um... Thank you for joining and thank you for your interest in uncrewed systems. It's a very exciting time in NOAA with all the rapid developments in technology. So I'm really um, uh, excited to be kicking off this, this, this discussion. So first of all, what are uncrewed systems? Well, I have some, some examples for you here on this slide and I'll start here on the upper right. Uh, this is a NOAA Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory glider called the Oculus Glider. And so this device goes up and down in the ocean for sometimes months at a time, collecting all kinds of information about the ocean. And then whenever it surfaces, it will transmit this information uh, back to NOAA via satellite systems. Going down to the right, about the, the four o'clock position, you see a large yellow torpedo looking uh, instrument. Um, this is a AUV or autonomous underwater vehicle operated by the Office of Coast Survey called the REMA 600. In this case, it's being deployed off a NOAA ship, and its principal mission is ocean mapping and hydrography. These systems are highly autonomous, meaning they go in the water, and they can often uh, go on their own for um, uh, long periods of time. So down at the bottom is the Xblue Drix being operated off a NOAA ship. Uh, we are using these systems in NOAA. They operate autonomously at the surface, similar to a small boat with nobody uh, in, the, in, the, in the actual device, but operating remotely. And this is being used for ocean mapping and hydrographic surveys. In the lower left, you can see a small drone or uncrewed aircraft system being operated for NOAA fisheries. Uh, drones or UAS have been very, very widely used now in the National Marine Fisheries Service for marine mammals. And you'll hear more about that today as well. In the upper left, we have another uh, buoyancy glider. And up to the, uh, at about the 11 o'clock position, you can see a autonomous sailboat called the Sail Drone. And NOAA has been using this in several different areas. And you'll be hearing more about that today as well. 
Uh, and you can see some other examples of long range AUVs or, or UAS in the, in the two other pictures. So all these systems have some commonalities. Um, they're either remotely operated remotely or they have a high degree of autonomy. So it doesn't take somebody actually uh, constantly controlling some of these devices. Some of them don't need commands for, for months at a time. Some of the UAS actually are controlled manually. So there's a, a degree of remoteness from the operation. And more and more of these systems are becoming robotic in nature and, and, and highly autonomous. Uh, the UXS Operations Center uh, is helping NOAA to expand all these systems. Uh, all the NOAA line offices and the programs you'll hear about uh, have been developing the systems for many years. And so over the next hour, you'll be learning more about some specific missions where NOAA is developing uncrewed systems. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for that overview, Phil. Our next presenter is Katie Sweeney, a biologist at the Marine Mammal Laboratory of NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Seattle, Washington. Katie has researched stellar sea lion and northern fur seal population dynamics and life history at NOAA since 2007. She is an FAA certified remote pilot and has been flying UAS since 2014. Katie will share how she developed a novel approach to survey northern fur seals in Alaska. Go ahead, Katie. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, I just wanna orient you on how I'll be talking about these figures. So I'll be starting in the upper left and then following the arrows around to the right and then down and then the bottom row from right to left. Um, so the Alaska Northern Fur Seal population I'll be talking about is listed as depleted under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And in 2019, we estimated the lowest pup production in over hundred years. Our traditional method for surveying fur seals in the Pribilof Islands involves a ground-based mark recapture method that requires up to 22 people to be on island for up to three weeks. This work is very intensive, costly, causes disturbance, which we are permitted to do, and as is inherent when working with wild animals, it can pose potential risk to personnel. Unfortunately, fur seals are small and black, so they blend in really well with the background, as you can see from the pups circled in teal. This makes developing a UAS approach with just a visual camera a challenge, as many of these animals can't be accurately detected with the human eye, making it less possible for artificial intelligence. I met a company called GeoThink Tank, which I will refer to as GTT, at a UAS workshop, and they brought up the idea of pursuing a multispectral approach to see if we could go beyond the visible wavelengths and target other wavelengths to make the first seals pop out from the background. This effort began with us collecting spectral reflectance from various parts of the body of different age sex classes of first seals and also different substrate types in the area. GTT conducted an analysis of these tens of thousands of signatures and came up with six classes of background signatures and four classes of first seal signatures, which you can see depicted as the colorful lines in the bottom right figure. GTT was then able to analyze which first seal signatures had the greatest separation from the background. And you can see the gray shaded regions there were found to be the optimal wavelengths. GTT then evaluated 13 different sensors which included hyperspectral, multispectral, and small UAS multispectral sensors. Of the 13, they were able to narrow it down to seven to conduct virtually simulated aerial surveys of a virtually modern, modeled rookery environment. So this was not um, done in real life. The bottom middle figure shows how well the sensors performed. The columns represent each of the background classes and each row represents a sensor. The left red group depicts dry fur seal silhouettes against the various background classes, and the blue section depicts wet fur seals. We ultimately decided on the Tetracam macaw sensor given the price, resolution, and customizable options. We customized the sensor with three visible wavelengths, three near infrared, and two infrared. We had the sensor mounted to an octocopter and we plan to conduct surveys in July of 2022. The next step will be to use images collected to create a training data set for AI development to automate image processing and counting. The literature indicates that these methods have not been used on wildlife applications, and we hope that this could be a good approach for surveying cryptic species. Thank you. 
Thank you, Katie. It sounds like a, a, a good approach. So our next speaker, Dr. Andrea Vanderwood, will discuss rapid response to changing conditions in the Great Lakes. Andrea is a satellite oceanographer, data scientist, and geologist. She has been using remote sensing for more than 20 years, and specifically hyperspectral imagery for more than five years to understand ecological and physical processes in the Great Lakes and the coastal and southern ocean. Andrea? Great, thanks. Thank you so much for having me. Today I'm going to talk about NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory's uncrewed systems and how we use those to rapidly respond to changing conditions in the Great Lakes. So as Katie started out, I'm also going to orientate you a little bit. I'm going to start out from the left side of the slide and then move to the right. So our first rapid response efforts have been focused on supporting our ongoing program to monitor cyanobacteria harmful algal blooms in the Great Lakes, which we also call cyanohabs for short. There are multiple observation platforms, including, including a set of uncrewed platforms that we combine with the weekly on water sampling. And those are used to inform stakeholders in the region about the aerial extent, as well as the toxicity of the cyanohab. Within the past few years, and um, Captain Hall showed this image as well on his first slide, within the past few years, we've coordinated with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and their long range autonomous underwater vehicle that measures chlorophyll, as well as their AUV with an environmental sampling processor that measures toxicity. And Reagan Herrera, the PI at Glural, leads those efforts along with others uh, through NOAA that are on the project. Within the past two years, we've combined that with our hyperspectral crude flights, which is on the bottom here. And I'm showing one of our amazing true color images taken. This is just one three-dimensional image taken from the hyperspectral camera that we fly weekly over the Great Lakes and specifically over Lake Erie. We combine those with the uncrewed systems to get a three-dimensional picture. And that is key for stakeholders in the region and specifically drinking water intake managers with water intakes that are at depth. So it gives the surface information from the hyperspectral camera, as well as the subsurface information in a three-dimensional perspective from the AUVs, from the uncrewed systems. And many of us had the great opportunity to pilot those uncrewed systems this past summer. The next piece I want to talk about is to build our the work that we're building upon for our crude flights with the hyperspectral camera every week. And if you peek really closely, that's actually me in the airplane in the top panel. And we fly the single engine Cessna airplane over the Great Lakes weekly. And this summer we will be working during the next HAB season, we'll be working on also pairing that with near shore measurements from the uncrewed system. So rapidly responding to the cyanohab events near shore where drinking water intakes are located. And we are working on integrating that into the M600, the drone that I'm showing here, the uncrewed system that I'm showing here. And we finished flight training for that just a few months ago. And that's the animated GIF in the middle. The secondary piece and applications for the future uh, starting next fall are monitoring rip current troughs. So we did a preliminary test and flew over the uh, eastern shore of Lake Michigan for rip current troughs. So there are many deaths that happen each year and actually along the shoreline of Lake Michigan as well as other shorelines in the Great Lakes. And the Weather Service out of, out of Grand Rapids, Michigan, actually has a warning system for rip currents. And we're working with them on coordinated efforts on how to improve that warning system. And lastly, I'm also the Coast Watch Manager for the Great Lakes Node. And through Coast Watch, we have an ICON product, which is an ice classification product. And we will be using our uncrewed systems to help validate that ice product as well as looking at near shore movement of ice and how that impacts the shoreline. Thanks so much for having me today. We're looking forward into the future of where uncrewed systems can take us in the Great Lakes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. This is such interesting work. 
We will now take a few minutes to address some of the questions submitted from you, our audience. You can type your questions in the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Asia? Thank you, Kelly. Um, and Phil, can you come back on screen as well? Um, I'll pass the qu first question to Katie. Uh, how will you continue your historical time series of first seal counts derived from the traditional method? So the historical um, time series that we have goes back pretty far. Um, and so the idea is to hopefully be able to compare ground survey counts to the aerial counts if we can do the survey in one year. And then we should be able to apply, hopefully, some sort of correction factor. Um, and that's kind of similar to what we've done with cellar sea lions as well when we changed our method. Thank you for that. Um, the next question is for Andrea. How often do you fly over Lake Erie? And what's the turnaround time that you provide reports to the water intake municipalities? So we fly over Lake Erie on a weekly time scale, usually every Monday. And then sometimes we have a longer flight that we conduct um, in coordination with the sampling once a month. Our turnaround period it is impressive at this point, if I, if I can brag just a little bit. You know, we've been doing this for almost eight years now. And so we have the processing scripts down to turn around the data within a 24 to 48 hour period for the drinking water managers. And that's funneled through the uh, Ohio EPA as well as the Michigan DNR. Awesome, thank you. Thank um, you. And the final question I'll ask is for Phil. Um, what are the greatest challenges to operationalizing UXS in NOAA? Yeah, thank you. Unfortunately, my camera stopped working, so I'll answer the question. So the challenges are are several and really interesting. Um, it's a case where the technology is almost faster than the regulation. So you can imagine with UAS, um, there are concerns because there are um, uh, aircraft that are flying in the airspace. And so in order to fly beyond visual line of sight, it requires a lot of very special mitigations, which are still being worked out. So the FAA has a vision. In fact, there's rulemaking going on to figure out how to fly UAS beyond visual range, and that's ongoing. So the full potential of things you may have heard about like package deliveries, a lot of that depends on working out the regulations. Uh, similar with the marine systems in that, you know, right now um, there's not a whole lot of regulations about what can be out there. And someday you could have a, a complete autonomous ships or highly autonomous ships and the rules for all those things have not quite been sorted out. Great, thank you. And Phil, I'll ask you one more question since we have you. Um, what are the benefits of uncrewed systems over traditional technologies like aircrafts and ships? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So it, it, in some cases, it takes a lot of uh, people to operate uncrewed systems. And uh, there are cases where missions were very expensive, like some of the marine mammal surveys that used uh, helicopters and aircraft are now being replaced by um, UAS or drones. So there's a real capability uh, and cost savings. Um, and, you know, in some cases, when we do some of our ship-based surveys, it's just one or two sensors. And if we can put that on a remotely uh, operated small boat, uh, we can potentially gain a lot more field work during that same time. Thank you so much for that, Phil. Um, and thanks for all the great questions. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Kelly. Thank you, Asia. Uh, we uh, remember, we want to remind you, you can type your question in the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Some of you have already done that. And we will now transition to our next group. Uh, Dr. Kimberly Galvez is currently an expedition coordinator at NOAA Ocean Exploration. Her role is to plan, coordinate, and execute ocean exploration expeditions to ensure unknown or poorly known areas in U.S. waters to explore, I'm sorry, unknown or poorly known areas in U.S. waters in the high seas. Kim's background is in marine geology and she earned her doctoral degree just last year. Kim, tell us about exploring the deep with ROBs. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so to start, NOAA Ocean Exploration operates with many tools to successfully complete a deep sea exploration expedition. One of these tools is the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer, and the second, as Captain Hall mentioned earlier, the dual body remotely operated vehicles or ROVs systems that are utilized that are named Deep Discover, referred to normally as D2, and Sirius, and these are the primary tools used. 
These submersible robots are connected to each other and to the ship via a tether that transmit oper op operative commands from the ship while the ROVs send back data. And this includes the high definition video that's also live, as well as oceanographic data from their surroundings. And the oceanographic data includes, but it's also not limited to, salinity, temperature, depth, and dissolved oxygen. NOAA Ocean Exploration ROVs are rated to depths of approximately 6,000 meters or 3.7 miles. Not only are the ROVs equipped with high-end imaging capabilities, but D2 is also equipped with two hydraulic manipulator arms that you can see actually in um, one of the images there with a claw. And one of the primary arms is that image uh, to collect geologic samples, as well as it collects uh, biologic samples that are benthic, known as also on the deep floor, uh, sea floor, and pelagic or within the water column. There's also, uh, there's also a suction sampler, and it's also used for fragile collections such as jellyfish or unconsolidated sediments, as you can see in the image above the clock. D2 is also equipped with five Niskin bottles that can collect water samples on near the seafloor or within the water column. Sirius is what is known as a camera sled. It is connected to the ship via one tether and then to D2 via another one. And this setup allows for Sirius to directly absorb any heave from the ship while D2 remains relatively stable for the pilots to handle and maneuver. This two-bodied system also provides an extra light source that through the camera system that can give the pilots and scientists as well as any other viewers that are uh, participating an expanded view of the overall ocean. Utilizing these tools, NOAA Ocean Exploration's mission is to explore and obtain a first look at previously unexplored or poorly understood deep sea environments. These environments include um, all different kinds of geomorphology and habitats all on the seafloor. We also conduct dives to explore the water column and these discoveries such as species not yet known to science or even range extensions of these organisms occur with almost every single dive conducted. This form of data collection allows for the observation of these habitats and organisms for the behavior of them to be observed in situ, providing a unique opportunity for the potential behavior of these animals that you can see uh, here in the predation event of the sea urchin consuming the coral in the image in the upper right corner. NOAA Ocean Explorations practices a FAIR technique or findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data techniques, where all these data are collected and are free and made accessible within approximately 30 days um, of the expedition. And deep ocean remains barely explored. And despite it being still out of sight with the advancement of these uncrewed systems, this vast biome is no longer out of mind. That was awesome. Thank you, Kim. Next, we'll hear from Rob Downs. Since 2004, he has been the lead for the o Office of Coast Survey's Uncrewed Systems Projects, including the test, evaluation, and operational transition of shallow and mid-water autonomous underwater vehicles and uncrewed surface vehicles. Currently, Rob is the acting chief of the Hydrographic Systems and Technology Branch of the Coast Survey Development Laboratory and manages projects to integrate autonomous control systems in traditionally crewed hydrographic survey launches and demonstrate purpose-built USVs for acoustic surveys from NOAA hydrographic and fisheries survey ships. Rob, tell us more. Great, thank you uh, for the opportunity to present. As Captain Paul discussed in the opening presentation, there is a wide variety of uncrewed systems in use in NOAA. And the greatest benefits from those systems are gained from applying the right technology for the job at hand. So today I'd like to talk about why Coast Survey is using a variety of uncrewed systems for seafloor mapping. First is improved flexibility and responsiveness. We use small autonomous underwater vehicles and small uncrewed surface vehicles to perform navigation safety surveys in rapid response to natural disasters or maritime incidents. These portable systems can be easily transported to a survey area and deployed by hand from shore or small boats with a minimal crew. Additionally, these systems have been used to meet smaller scale survey requirements that would have otherwise been delayed until a crewed survey vessel was in the region. Also, the small surface vehicles are able to survey in very shallow water and pass under low bridges giving us the ability to collect data in areas that our crewed boats cannot access. Which leads me to the second use, 
specialized uncrewed systems enhance our observational capabilities. Underwater vehicles with depth ratings up to 500 meters allow us to collect higher resolution bathymetry than is possible with sonars installed on NOAA ships in support of NOAA science requirements, such as deep sea coral assessment in the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. Also, in collaboration with other NOAA offices and industry partners, we've deployed long endurance wind and solar powered surface vehicles to perform reconnaissance surveys in the Arctic when NOAA ships were unable to sail due to COVID restrictions. Next, we use uncrewed surface vehicles, such as our optionally crewed hydrographic survey launches, which integrate autonomy systems into existing crewed small boats to test concepts of operation and gain expertise in shipboard operations. And this is in preparation for the shipboard evaluation of a purpose-built uncrewed surface vehicle, which has the speed and multi-day endurance capabilities necessary to work in tandem with NOAA ships providing the potential to increase the data acquisition capacity of our hydrographic survey ships by up to 40% by serving as a force multiplier. But of course, increasing our survey capabilities without delivering the best quality data to users in a timely manner is of limited benefit. So the unseen aspect of our uncrewed systems effort is the development of software to ensure the quality of the data collected and automated data processing tools to deliver that data more quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Our third speaker in this group is Dr. Melissa Wagner, a postdoctoral research associate at the Cooperative Institute for Severe and High Impact Weather Research and Operations, or CRO, here in Norman, Oklahoma. She works in support of the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory. Melissa has a background in remote sensing and geography focusing on land cover change and impacts. Her research uses UAS technologies and geospatial methods to study damage from tornadoes and high winds in rural areas. And she hopes to better understand severe storm dynamics in the Southeastern United States. Melissa. Thanks, Kelly. So we're using UAS technologies in order to better characterize high wind damage in rural areas and uh, to vegetation. So by using UAS technologies, we're able to gain uh, better access into otherwise inaccessible or remote locations. So the images on, on the top right show that with the aerial perspective, we're able to better capture the extent of the tornado damage path. So we can actually see in the tree fall pattern, this is showing you uh, damage following the Sawyerville, Alabama tornado that happened uh, this past March. We're also able to look at structural damage as well too. So with it, this information, we're able to coordinate with the National Weather Service forecast offices and help fill in gaps in damage surveys, as well as assist emergency managers and uh, share information with them, which can help uh, with their uh, disaster response and recovery. So we are using a fixed wing, and this is equipped with both a visible and multi-spectral camera. The nice thing about using a multi-spectral camera is that it can uh, better capture or detect damage to vegetation that we otherwise wouldn't be able to see with the human eye. So if we look at the images on the bottom right, we can, if we compare the visible with the multi-spectral image, we can actually see that the multi-spectral image provides and detects more of the damage associated with the tornado that had gone through this cornfield. And so by better documenting high wind damage, this can help improve severe storm climatology in rural areas and better inform risk as well as disaster preparedness. And with this uh, information, we can correlate it with storm signatures that we see in radar, as well as with other observational networks, which could potentially improve our understanding of severe storm dynamics. We're particularly interested in the South US because severe storm dynamics are a little bit different, as well as there's a higher number of fatalities to in part due to nocturnal events. So some of the outcomes or products that we hope to produce from this research is that we want to be able to process and share this UAS imagery with NOAA agencies, as well as emergency managers in a timely manner. 
So we've developed a cloud computing infrastructure in order to be able to do that. A big part is really being able to better rate uh, tornadic intensity in rural areas where there are limited uh, damage indicators for vegetation, which would then also help really improve severe storm climatology. And with this information, we really want to be able to understand high wind impacts in these areas and how land cover can influence the damage patterns that we're actually seeing. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. It, it's now time for some questions. We appreciate those of you in our audience who have submitted them. And if you have a question you want to ask, type it in the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Asia? Thank you, Kelly. Uh, the first question is for Kim. How many samples can be collected during a single dive? So we can collect up to 11 samples, um, not including the skin bottle. So we have a five, suck, a five chamber suction sampler. We're able to collect two geologic samples, four biologic samples, and then uh, water samples up to five within the skin bottles. Thank you. Uh, the second question is for Rob. Uh, will uncrewed systems replace ship crews, surveyors, and scientists? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, uh, as Captain Hall mentioned, uh, the Uncrewed systems do require, or some, most of them require some degree of supervision. Um, what we're expecting from using uncrewed system aboard our ships is that we can better use our personnel and their expertise as scientists and surveyors for um, tasks that require their, their expertise, a human intervention, and allow the robots, the uncrewed system, to do sort of the mundane work. Thank you, Rob. Um, and then the last question is for Melissa. We may have time for two more. Um, why do you use multispectral imagery to assess damage to vegetation? So we're using multispectral imagery so that we can uh, look at uh, the damage information. The nice thing about the multispectral camera is it's been used extensively in agriculture because vegetation is more responsive in the near infrared bands as well as the red and the red edge. So by looking at this, we're able to really capture damage or to vegetation that we otherwise wouldn't be able to see with the, in the visible bands. Thank you. And then uh, one more question for Melissa. Do you plan to expand this work across the country to other areas like the Western US? Um, absolutely. So we're really interested in looking at areas like the High Plains, as well as looking at other different types of, of vegetation cover as well, too. Um, it'd be really interesting to look at some of the native vegetations. Um, great. And I'll do one more for Kim. Uh, how do scientists and people connect and participate during an expedition? Oh, it ranges. Um, we have participants that connect uh, worldwide. Uh, we through our telepresence technology, anyone that wants to participate can participate through oceanexplorer.noaa.gov. We have live seeds going on with every expedition that's there. And we also have a scientist oriented one that's a higher resolution uh, video feed that's live and also has a, a shorter delay so that any form of interest, whether it be biological or geological, um, scientists can uh, announce those either via chat or on the telephone so that pilots and scientists on board can also then direct uh, for that information. But anywhere from a few hundred to several thousands, as sometimes we have live interactions, just this past year we had 177,000 people People join. So um, it's a really great effort that we're able to utilize the telepresence on this ship and, and we hope to continue to increase the participation over the years. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to Kelly in the interest of time. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Asia, and thank you, everyone. Um, don't you all think this is an interesting topic? I, I, I do. Uh, we've already heard about several uses of uncrewed systems and we're going to learn about more in our last group. Dr. Adrian Sutton is an oceanographer at NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory and an affiliate assistant professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. Her research group focuses on the patterns of and technology necessary to observe air-sea CO2 exchange and ocean acidification. Last year, Adrian and her collaborators at PMEL received the Department of Commerce Ron Brown Excellence in Innovation Award and the Group Gold Medal in Scientific and Engineering Achievement for the first autonomous circumnavigation of Antarctica. 
And that's what she's going to talk with us about today. Adrian. Thank you. So one focus of my work at PMEL is using new technologies that have the ability to fill persistent gaps in the ocean observing system. And in this footage, you're looking at one of those gaps, which was recorded on an uncrewed surface vehicle during the first autonomous circumnavigation of Antarctica in 2019. Persistent ocean observing gaps exist because they are far away from the world's ocean research infrastructure, which is primarily in the northern hemisphere. There are areas of the ocean that don't see high traffic of cargo vessels we use as ships of opportunity for making ocean measurements because that high traffic also tends to be most dense in the northern hemisphere. And persistent gaps are seasonal too, given ships and other surface this platforms like buoys can't survive the, the harshest conditions in many areas, especially um, the polar seas. So this footage shows exactly why collecting uh, surface ocean observations in the Southern Ocean can be really challenging. I was convinced the Southern Ocean would quickly swallow a, a little robot, but amazingly it survived. So my research focuses on the ocean's uptake of carbon dioxide, absorbing a quarter of the CO2 emitted into the atmosphere every year. And those persistent gaps um, cause large uncertainties in our understanding of this ocean sink. Without reducing that uncertainty, we will not be able to track the impact of carbon mitigation efforts at the time scale that policymakers expect. These uncertainties also impact our ability to detect whether ocean uptake of CO2 is decreasing over time, which models predict to happen as the ocean becomes warmer and carbon chemistry and circulation changes. But the good news is we now have the tools to reduce that uncertainty. This sail drone USV sailed for nearly 200 days over 22,000 kilometers, collecting over 4,700 measurements of CO2 and seawater and air with a sensor that we developed at PMEL and has been used internationally over the past two decades on surface buoys. The USV survived freezing temperatures, 15 meter waves, and a collision with an iceberg. Um, during the late fall and early winter portion of the mission, we observed strong outgassing of CO2 from the ocean to atmosphere. This was while the USV was going through some parts of the Indian Ocean sector of the Southern Ocean where wintertime measurements of surface ocean CO2 had never been collected before. On average across this entire region, the Southern Ocean is still an overall sink for CO2, but it's this variability of uptake and outgassing that we need to better quantify. While these USVs are relatively new, the CO2 sensor that we use on them is not, and the ocean CO2 data collected from these systems are included every year in global carbon assessments. So the ocean carbon community is really primed to rapidly expand these observations and feed them into those climate products. Thanks again for having me, and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Adrian. That video really puts you there, doesn't it? <laughs> Uh, Dr. Greg Folt is an oceanographer from NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory in Miami, Florida. His research is concentrated primarily on tropical cyclone ocean interaction and tropical climate variability and change and their links to the ocean. He is the co-lead scientist of an experimental hurricane sail drone mission. Greg, tell us about using sail drones to improve hurricane forecasts. We can't hear you. Greg, we can't hear you. Sorry about that. I was muted. Okay. So, Please start so over. Thanks everyone for joining. So I'll talk about another uh, sail drone project. So this one we partnered with sail drone. NOAA and sail drone partnered to deploy five sail drones during the peak of this past hurricane season. We deployed them in the Western Atlantic and the Caribbean Sea. Uh, and the main goal was to improve our understanding of hurricane intensification and ultimately improve forecasts of hurricane intensity. Uh, so these were special sail drones. So these were uh, specially designed so that they could withstand the very harsh conditions in a major hurricane. They had a shorter wing, a shorter sail. They were more stable and they had more rugged sensors. Um, 
And this was the first time that we'd attempted this, the first time anyone had attempted to send a, a sail drone or any surface wind powered uh, vehicle directly into a uh, hurricane. Uh, so the bottom left figure here, this shows a map and the color, so the, the shading, the gray shading is the sea surface temperature during the hurricane season. So we deployed the sail drones where uh, the ocean was warm and where we expected hurricanes to uh, pass and to intensify. Uh, the colored trajectories in that map show the where the sail drones went during the during their mission and during the hurricane season and the colors are the wind speed measured by the sail drones uh, we also coordinated three of the sail drones with ocean gliders uh, these the ocean glider tracks are shown as the uh, pink lines in that map and this was the first time that this had been attempted to coordinate underwater gl gliders underwater measurements uh, with surface ocean atmosphere measurements from something like a sail drone. Um, and the peak, so the, the real um, highlight of the mission was Hurricane Sam, category four Hurricane Sam passing directly over one of the sail drones. And this is the trajectory in the eastern part of the map there, the Western Atlantic. Uh, the red and the orange indicate very high wind speeds measured by the sail drone as the hurricane passed over. Um, and there were five other tropical cyclones that passed over or very close to sail drones. These are the other black trajectories in that map. So then this, this movie here that's showing, so this, this is from the sail drone that passed through uh, Hurricane Sam when it was category four, it passed just to the west of the Eastern eye wall, that bottom left figure there is the satellite infrared image as Hurricane Sam passed right over the sail drone. And so it's just inside the eye wall measured winds of up to 125 miles per hour and waves of more than 50 feet. Uh, it did very well, it returned good quality data to us in real time that we're just beginning to analyze. And the bottom right shows an example, the enthalpy flux, the exchange of heat energy from the ocean to the hurricane that we calculated from the data from the cell drone. And we hope that data like this will help us to improve our uh, understanding of hurricanes and improve forecasts of their intensification. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Another great video. I know that one was uh, shown on TV a lot uh, after that hurricane. Uh, Commander Paul Himmick is an officer in the NOAA Corps, currently serving as the Chief of NOAA's Uncrewed Aircraft Systems Division at the Aircraft Operations Center in Lakeland, Florida. His team provides safety, policy, fleet management, and project oversight spanning a diverse array of UAS missions throughout the entire agency to include all the things you've heard about today and more. Uh, marine mammal surveys, damage assessment, coastal mapping, atmospheric vertical profiling, and hurricane research. Paul received his NOAA commission in 2004 and has had the unique opportunity to sail on NOAA ships, fly NOAA aircraft, and now manage NOAA UAS operations. Tell us more, Paul. All right. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Sorry for the dark screen. Hopefully you can uh, hear me better than you can see me, but uh, I'm also ha happy that I'm going last. I get to kind of recap uh, and sort of cheerlead for, for the UXS community and the, and the panelists today. So uh, before I start, quick history lesson. Uh, let's take, let's go back to December 17th, 1903, talking about the Wright brothers, and they got the Wright flyer up in the air for 12 seconds. Again, that's 12 seconds. It was an amazing feat, amazing accomplishment. Let's fast forward about 118 years to today. Uh, just, this uh, just this October, uh, a UAS set the record, right, for uh, long endurance uh, unrefueled, you know, gas engine flight that was done at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, think about this for a second. Uh, the record for that was eight days, 15 minutes, and 47 seconds. I use this example to illustrate a point, and that's just the, the potential that we see with uh, uh, uncrewed systems. So let's bring all this technology back here to NOAA and just kind of soak in all these images as I speak, if you could. Um, I just want to point out that the people you're hearing from are the best and brightest that, that the world has to offer, the best in their field. And, uh, you know, when we couple uh, uh, this experience and expertise with, with, with the potential of uncrewed systems, we're looking at uh, a synergistic effect here and, and, and we're seeing a lot of firsts, right? We just saw that with the uh, with sail drone going right into Hurricane Sam and some other things as well. So uh, UAS and, and, and marine systems are, are being used in very, very clever ways and innovative ways to, to boost our collective understanding of the environment uh, the ecosystem or whatever target of interest we're looking at, whether it's marine mammals, um, uh, greenhouse gases, or, or, or damage-stricken areas from, uh, from tornadoes or hurricanes or what have you. So 
I'm going to throw out an example for you of a, a research and development project. Research and development project right now. Uh, Joe Thion's team over at AOM AOML is working with the Aircraft Operations Center and the UXS Operations Center. Uh, we're working on, on deploying a P3 uh, air launched UAS called the Altius. Again, this is in research and development, but the, the idea here is, is, you know, is characterizing the hurricanes. So uh, in more ways than just uh, reconnaissance, we're looking at intensifying hurricanes. So you can go to sleep with a category two out there, wake up the next day and see it as a category four or even a five. And so why is this happening? We don't truly understand it quite yet. So, so what better way than to send a UAS into that hurricane environment? Uh, and, and uh, collect data in the boundary layer of that storm. where We can't send our airplanes or our people. It's simply too dangerous. How do we do it? We must do it with a UAS or a marine system like the Strat already at uh, the cell drone. Uh, we're also looking at ways to collect greenhouse gases from very hard to reach, uh, no pun intended, places like the stratosphere. So uh, uh, Colm Sweeney and Bianca uh, Bayer over at uh, the the um, OAR's GML, or Global Monitoring Laboratory, are working to send a UAS all the way up to 75,000 feet, drop it, and glide it all the way back down to Earth, collecting an air core sample along the way. Think about an ice core sample in Greenland, the Greenland ice sheet. We're doing the same thing with air here, so collecting very uh, hard to hard to reach uh, trace gases in the atmosphere. So I'm going to wrap it up with, with what's my role here at the OAS division. It's simply to facilitate and enable these people, these experts to go out in the field and do what they do the best with UAS, uh, you know, with its, with its sound policy and guidance, airspace vetting and approvals, training support, payload and, and platform choosing. And, then, and all, honestly, it's all about doing it in the safest manner possible and, 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 and just collecting as much wonderful data so we can characterize our planet and our Earth uh, the best way possible. Th thanks for your time and I yield. Thank you, Paul. And thanks for that summary. It was, it's a really exciting time. Um, it's now uh, we're ready for questions about these last three presentations. What questions do you have for these presenters, Asia? Um, a lot came in on sail drones, but I will sprinkle them throughout the next couple of question sessions. Um, so first for Adrian, how do other autonomous technologies like floats and gliders contribute to, the, to filling those gaps and reducing uncertainty in the ocean CO2 sink? Yeah, they definitely contribute. We, we need a mix of these observing technologies because right, we're still a ways away from an uncrewed system that can fly in the atmosphere, making all measurements, land on the sea surface, measure the sea surface, and then dive into the deep ocean to measure what's happening in the deep ocean. Right, so we need a mix of technologies right now. Um, the USBs I talked about really excel at observing that air-sea interface and floats and gliders really excel at connecting what we observe at the surface to the deep ocean and, and vice versa. So for example, how biological production in the surface ocean eventually leads to carbon storage in the deep ocean. So definitely, um, definitely we need a mix of, of observing technologies. Thank you. Um, I got a couple questions on, um, you know, just operational things about sail drones. So one, um, any chance that we'll ever get the audio for the hurricane um, sail drone? Or is yeah, it available? <laughs> yes, I'd say stay tuned. Um, it, it can be done uh, if it's something that, that people uh, really want. And I think it would be exciting to, I also think it's exciting to be able to hear the sound. So. Yeah, we're working on it. Hopefully, in future missions. Hopefully, uh, next year or the year after, we can we can work that out. Okay. And then, how do you decide where to deploy sail drones at the start of the mission? Um, yeah. So for the the hurricane mission, we we um, looked at historical data uh, going back about 20 years, and we so we got historical tropical cyclone tracks and intensities, and from that we can estimate the chances uh, during a given hurricane season whether a hurricane will pass within a certain region in the tropical Atlantic. So we looked at that data, calculated it, and we put our sail drones where we had the highest chance of experiencing high winds from a hurricane. Great, thank you. Um, for Paul, what does the future look like with the use of uncrewed systems in NOAA? Uh, that's, that's a great question, and, and thank you for that. And I think Captain Hall alluded to this uh, uh, sort of up front, and, and uh, you know, beyond visual line of sight, that uh, that is an area that that's I think uh, that's the holy grail right now, right? So um, 
again, the FAA is, is catching up to the, to the ideas and to the research that we're trying to uh, put out there. So we have all these great ideas. We want to send UAS to, to, to 5,000 feet, up to 10,000 feet in the national airspace, but we can't do that right now very easily. In fact, it's uh, it's almost, uh, I don't want to say impossible, but we are, we are in fact, working with the FAA to, 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 to get to these types of altitudes. But I think you're going to see uh, sort of a quantum leap in, in, in the way forward once the FAA uh, and and um, uncrewed traffic management and all these things that are happening right now they're all happening um, as you saw as you're seeing with uh, with drone deliveries these are it's just the beginning so when it comes to opening up the airspace and integrating UAS into the airspace on a routine basis and beyond visual line of sight we're going to see amazing things so that's what that's that's the future great and one more question along those lines um, will the new infrastructure bill help accelerate these autonomous and uncrewed technologies? I want to. I, the answer to that I, I want to say is going to be yes, because now there's there's a focus there's a focus on on building infrastructure and along with that on crude systems and 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 again I, I think it's all wrapped up together here. So so the answer is a in my opinion a resounding yes. Great, thank you. Um, all these presentations have been excellent, and at this point I want to welcome um, all of our panelists back onto the screen and open up for questions for everyone. Great. Okay. So I will start with um, uh, this question was for all presenters, so anyone could answer this. Is there a current or expected future role for lighter than air on crewed vehicles for high endurance aerial surveys? I can maybe take a start. That's a really good question. So those are really getting really interesting, right? The 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 ones I've seen, uh, big blimps and other, other things like that. And they've been used, and, and you know, I'm not sure if Katie can share about what they've been done with marine mammal surveys in the past. But yeah, I think there's a role. We don't. Um, uh, we've looked at also stratospheric UAS that could stay up there for weeks that are solar powered. So it seems to be developing. And so yeah, I do think there's there's some really exciting future in those areas. We've had a couple of. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, we've had a couple of fixed wing um, beyond visual line of sight efforts at the Marine Mammal Lab. Um, one was to survey ice seals and one was to survey um, whales up in the Arctic. And uh, while those were um, fairly successful, it definitely uh, gave us a lot of opportunities to learn lessons and how to uh, make it more efficient uh, when the regula regulatory um, uh, when the regulations have updated to allow that. Great, and um, I've got a lot of questions about um, blending artificial intelligence with um, and machine learning with uncrewed systems. So one of them was, um, would Noah be interested in edge artificial intelligence or machine learning to do local species identification and other functions? Erin Moreland is actually working on edge uh, AI or edge computing AI. Um, they're trying to survey ice seals with a really big system that has three visual cameras, three UV cameras, and three IR or thermal cameras. And that's to set, uh, survey ice seals and also identify polar bears. Um, and so they have real time AI processing while flying so that they can trigger when the camera needs to fire when the IR camera senses a hot spot so that they don't collect millions and millions of images during the survey. Awesome, thank you, Katie. And then another AI question for Adrian, um, do you use, and I guess for Greg as well, do you use AI to assist with watching all those hours of video footage that you get from the sail drones? Go for it, Greg. Tell them we're relevant to your research. What was the last part of the question? Watching. Um, oh, sorry. Do you use AI to assist with watching all the hours of video footage that you get from your sail drones? Uh, no, we don't. No, yeah, we don't have that much video. Uh, you know, if we go through a, if we go through a strong hurricane, we we have some video clips, but otherwise, yeah. Not yet, though. I mean, maybe in the future. That might be good for things like uh, the the state of the sea, the sea state, and spray, sea spray, and things like that. 
and detecting icebergs. <laughs> and then Adrian, similar, do you use it at all? Because you have, a, I guess, a longer run of footage. Okay. I haven't, um, but I could see how it could be useful for detecting icebergs and staying away from the ice, right? Absolutely. Um, I got a question about the sail drones that are currently being employed in the Gulf Stream and where they're headed. Um, and what do you guys know about those? Yeah, that's a project that's being led by University of Rhode Island. Um, and there they have three sail drones that are surveying the Gulf Stream um, throughout this winter. Um, and the focus is definitely on constraint. That's another area where that is a large carbon sink. So um, one of the goals is to constrain that carbon sink. Um, data are also being fed into weather forecasting. Um, uh, so there's a, definitely a weather forecasting component of that too. But that is a, a Google funded project. Great, thank you. Um, I got a question about careers. Is there a career path for NOAA Corps officers to specialize or be involved in uncrewed aircraft systems? I love that question. I'll, I'll take that if that's okay. I, I love that question because it's something I'm actively thinking about on a daily basis. Um, the answer right now is not yet, but uh, again, this is, uh, this is all happening you know, as we speak and, and uh, I'm actively thinking about ways to bring in no core officers, excuse me, <clears throat> off the ships, you know, from the fleet, rotate them through either uh, uh, the UAS division or the uh, the UMS division, which is in uh, sure between Biloxi uh, and Newport, Oregon. So, uh, so there's just there's going to be a tremendous opportunity, and also through the UXS Operations Center in Silver Spring, Maryland. So there is going to be plenty of opportunities. We're just trying to figure this out right now as we speak. Yeah. And I'll just add real quick. I'll just add real quick too. Sorry, is is I'm seeing a lot of excitement from the junior officers too. There's a lot of folks that are um, really excited about this, and we're getting UAS on the NOAA ships too. So you're going to see a lot of experience building here within the junior ranks, and and uh, we're very excited about that as well. Great, thank you. Um, and then uh, one more question before we wrap. Um, have there been any studies to show gains, so budgetary personnel, data quality type gains made using UX systems? So I can say um, we certainly, uh, when it comes to things like hurricane research, uh, NOAA has looked at uncrewed systems and their potential impacts on the forecast. And I know that some of the other uncrewed systems, sail drone, ocean gliders they're also conducting some of these studies uh there's um you know ideas that we we think we will increase the efficiency of the fleet so we have internal studies but that's a big part of what we call transition from research to operations so when it transitions the the business case and the benefit is part of that plan i don't know if any of the sail drone folks want to talk about the uh the impacts Yeah, right. Like you mentioned, it's a big it's a big goal. I mean, having the sail drone missions into hurricane, it's a huge priority is to improve forecasts. So we really want to uh, improve hurricane forecasts and uh, make this operational as much as possible. But it, we're in the very early stages at this point, so it's mostly a, a learning you know learning experience and uh, research and kind of optimizing uh, how we do this. And I, have, I have something to add. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, just in the project that I presented on, um, assuming it works, uh, we could potentially reduce our costs of doing surveys of both our first seals by up to 80%. So that's definitely a big bonus. Um, for stellar sea lions, it's not necessarily saving money, but it's giving us more access to get the data when it's typically pretty hard with weather. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. Um, those have been really great questions, and I appreciate the audience for supplying supplying us with great things to ask our presenters. Uh, with that, I will turn it back to Kelly to wrap up. Yes, we always like to start on time and end on time. So, uh, and, and the hour goes so quickly. That wraps today's three minute thesis webinar on NOAA's Uncrewed System. And as we end, please stay on for one more minute to answer a few brief questions that will appear on your screen. Your feedback is really helpful as we plan future webinars like this one. 
A big thanks to all of our wonderful panelists today, coordinators Bethany Perry and Asia, Asia Shumalo, and Megan Sinar, who provided technical assistance, as well as you, our audience. I hope you have learned something new. I know I have. Uh, if you're interested in checking out past webinars, visit our website, www.noaa.gov slash central region, where you will also find more great information. Thanks again for your participation and have a fine day.